Good afternoon, folks. This is the new Geely Galaxy 6, a compact sedan, 4.8 meters long and 2.75 meter wheelbase. They're asking $9,000 for the base trim and 13 for the top one. They claim they've achieved the most fuel efficient gasoline powertrain in the world, with fuel consumption of 2.9 liters, according to CLTC. The hybrid setup consists of a 1.5 liter ICE rated at 111 horsepower and a front electric motor. A single electric motor produces 160 horsepower with acceleration time of seven seconds. They claim it has the best thermal efficiency in the world at 46 point something percent. For $13,000, they offer both autopilot, simplified of course, not fully autonomous, and an automatic parking system. The suspension here is McPherson. Make yourselves comfortable, let's take a closer look. I'm sure many of you are wondering how they're offering the most advanced hybrid system in the world for $13,000. An interior like this, with this level of equipment, of course it's not top tier, but at this price in Europe, a car like this simply doesn't exist at all, not in this body size. In Europe, even at twice the price, there is no such car. What makes up the price of a car? It doesn't just come out of thin air. First is the raw materials and resources the car is made from. The main extractor on the planet is China. Germany, Japan and Korea extract almost nothing themselves. They buy all of it from China, and after that, they start manufacturing cars. It's already more expensive for them. From the very start, regardless of whether it's done poorly or well, it's already more expensive. Just by default, taxes are higher. Bureaucracy is more expensive. Logistics around the factory are more expensive. Less competition among contractors, which means higher prices from contractors. In China, there are one and a half billion people. China has one and a half billion people. The car warned me because there are roadworks ahead. I'm honestly shocked by what's going on. And it told me this by voice 300 meters in advance. Let's get out of here, otherwise we're about to get stuck in traffic. Moving on, a technological lag in factory robotization. As you can see, even before the question of whether it's built well or poorly, there's already a total price disadvantage compared to the Chinese. A total loss. At 187 centimeters tall, I can reach the steering wheel, but it's tight. Anyone taller than me is going to have problems here. Let's see what's behind. Two fists. How do you like it? What I have already said more than once. New platforms built around electric cars with or without a generator have absolutely wiped out pure internal combustion engines across the board. There's no longer any need for a massive hood just to cram in that ancient tractor-like setup. And now, let's quickly go over what you're getting for $13,000 besides seven second acceleration and a possible three liter fuel consumption. Just think about it. This is Geely. Geely did this. The same Geely people were laughing at 10 years ago. They say the next generation of this Thor system will have a thermal efficiency of 47%. Up top, I have a small sunroof for the driver with a manually operated shade. And you can actually open it. Can you believe that? The seat cushion is average. There is a case for the driver, not lined inside. The steering wheel adjustment is manual. Unfortunately, it can't be lowered, and it's just not quite enough for me. I need it a bit lower. The center screen is 15 inches, 7 inches for the driver, and the graphics have been upgraded as well, and that's cool. I remember when a screen like this appeared in the first Hi-Fi about four years ago, and also in the Lee One. Back then, it felt like wow. Today, screens like this are found even in the cheapest cars, and that's impressive. In terms of functionality, it's not the fastest chip, but at least it doesn't freeze or glitch. Everything responds, even if with a slight delay. 
I can't really criticize it. I don't see it lagging anywhere. Here the air is controlled physically. Look, there's this rotary dial. All the buttons here are physical ones, and they're related to the climate control. We can adjust the fan speed. The temperature is controlled here as well, and this dial can be assigned to a specific function. For example, right now it's set to control the temperature. There are two cup holders, an armrest, and it is not covered with anything. And it's the same here. In terms of equipment and materials, this car is in no way inferior to the BMW 3 Series. This is exactly how the Chinese completely outplayed the entire global auto industry in electronics and interior finishing. I mean, if you look at Toyota or Honda for this kind of money, or even more, you basically get cheap sneaker sole plastic. Here, the material feels almost like leather, even though it's synthetic. The trim here is plastic, of course, made to look like wood. The leatherette isn't top tier, but it's far from bad. In a Toyota RAV4, it's worse. And all the seats here are leatherette. There is no leather here at all, perforated. Ventilation and heating in the front, nothing in the back. Remember when I reviewed the BYD Chin L and was surprised by how comfortable the rear seat was? Usually in cars of this class, the backrest is too upright, the seat feels like a stool, and there's no knee room at all, because pure ice platforms have technologically lost to electric platforms. Here, I could ride far. I sink into the seat. I'm comfortable. It feels like sitting in a Camry. It's even worse in an Accord. And this is a car that's 4,800 millimeters long with a 2,050 millimeter wheelbase. The backrest doesn't adjust at all, but the angle is just right. I could ride like this for hours. Here is air vent and a USB-C. You can toss something in there. It's not lined with anything, just bare plastic. I don't even know if this needs to be mentioned, but at this price point, it's probably worth reminding you that there are rear power windows back here. If I pull, so look, I ended up in the trunk. There's no flat floor back here. Let's not waste time. I can already see it's not there. And now, attention. 609 liters. Get ready. This is the largest trunk I've ever seen at this price point and in this body size. And once again, this brings us back to the platform question. A trunk this huge and this much rear space for a car of this size is only possible because it's built on an electric platform. On the left is a 52 liter fuel tank. On the right are two charging ports. The base $9,000 version has a 9 kilowatt hour battery and does 60 kilometers on electric. The top version has a 17 kilowatt hour battery and up to 120 kilometers according to CLTC. In terms of consumption, let's even round it up to 3 liters. And this is CLTC. In real world winter conditions, you can add 50%, so it's more like 4.5, maybe even 5, if it's really cold. Well, and in the city during the summer, there will be, depending of course on your gas pedal, but it will be around 3, 3.2, 3.3, I think something like that. If I compare it to any car in the same class, like a Toyota Corolla, the Toyota barely moves at all, it feels completely gutless. You hit the gas, and first you get that typical two-second ice hesitation, and only then... Here it's completely different. Electric acceleration in seven seconds. Yes, it's not fast, but it's immediate. I don't like that the recuperation mode, when you release the gas, it starts braking on its own, but not immediately. I release it, it waits for a second, and only then does it start braking. What is this for? So that when you go over a bump, you don't have to slow down and slam the suspension. It just rolls over it on momentum and then starts braking. But I don't like that. I like to feel the car. When I lift off the throttle, it should slow down right away. The regenerative braking is medium, not weak, by the way. Medium. The suspension doesn't hit or crash here. I went over a few manhole covers before we started rolling the camera. The car isn't stiff. The handling is average. And it's dynamic compared to its competitors. When BYD came onto the scene, the entire global auto industry in that price segment just dropped in my eyes, completely dropped. Because BYD were the first to offer powerful powertrains, hybrid ones. I'm talking about hybrids. EVs are obvious, but hybrids. Powerful hybrid powertrains. And these are cars that can actually drive long distances. For me, that was a real eye-opener. When I saw the Geely Galaxy, hybrids with electric drive, with that instant response, and after I saw how much effort they put in, how they do it, the level of equipment, the materials, the interior finishes. Geely for me is now on the same level as BYD. Back when I was in Chengdu, I deliberately rode around in taxis and talked to the drivers. Nothing is falling apart. That's complete nonsense. 
I don't know which brands that applies to. Maybe Cherry has that issue. But Geely cars don't fall apart. Their wheels don't fly off. And on that note, we'll wrap it up. Thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves and your loved ones. See you soon.